Shalom, this is Levi Shore. Welcome back to Sweet and Good Torah. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the three weeks, which is a period that's also called the Bain HaMitzarim. It means between, between like a constrictive, uh, tight space, like between the two tragedies. So the first tragedy, it was the beginning of the three weeks, is on the uh, 17th of Tammuz, and it's a fast day. And it's the day that we were supposed to receive the first set of Luchos. It was the day that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, was supposed to come down from Mount Sinai with these two sapphire tablets, and written on the tablets were the Eser Debros. But unfortunately, what Moshe saw when he reached the bottom was he saw the, the Cheta Egel. He saw the sin of the golden calf, and then he saw the letters on these sapphire tablets begin to float up back to Shemayim, and he knew that Hashem wanted him to break the tablets. So we lost the first set of the tablets. So the beginning of the three weeks was supposed to be this great day of celebration. And the ending of the three weeks is Tisha B'Av, the ninth of the month of Av, three weeks later. And that was the tragedy of that was the day that the spies were coming back from spying out the land of, of um, Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. And they were supposed to give this great glowing report of how amazing the land was. And they found all this miraculous fruit. It took eight of the spies to carry this one cluster of grapes and they carried on these poles. And they had this giant, I think, giant remo and a giant pomegranate. And maybe a giant fig, I forgot the other fruit. It was uh, the seven species for which Eretz Israel is renowned, the seven great fruits for which the land of Israel is renowned. And it was supposed to be a great day. It would be the, probably the day that we entered um, the land of Israel for the first time as a nation. And it also should have been a great uh, uh, festival and a great celebration. And these would have been these three weeks of celebrating, the, receiving the Luchos, the Ten Commandments, and entering Eretz Yisrael. It was, it was great celebration. Unfortunately, it was not to be. And now they turn into these two fast days. And because we cried, because we mourned on the report of the spies, it became a day of mourning, and it was the day of the destruction of the, the first and second temples, the two um, Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim and Jerusalem. And these three weeks became a time of, of mourning, and um, a time at Teshuvah. So the question is, though, the question is, and we're going to expand our view beyond the three weeks, and we're going to look into a, a wider array of uh, Jewish history, is how did we survive through, how do we survive through the four exiles, and really the five exiles, if you want to count Mitzrayim, if you want to count Egypt. So how do we, dis how do we survive for the last 4,000 years? So first, let's take a look on the second Pusik, the very second Pusik of the Torah, um, second verse of the Torah. It says, V'haisa ha'aretz, v'haaretz haisa sohu v'avohu v'choshek al p'nei z'chon v'ruach elokim mirachefetz al p'nei hamayim. And the second Pusik in the Torah starts to hint at these four empires, these four exiles. So it says the land, the land was tohu, which kind of means chaos. And that refers to the first exile of Babel, of Babylon. And then Bohu is um, kind of like emptiness, desolation. I don't know if there's a good word for it, but uh, Bohu represents the second exile of uh, the exile of Persia and Media. And then Choshek, darkness, is the exile of the Greek Empire. And it's kind of interesting because the Greek Empire is renowned for its science and its art and its culture. But the Torah calls it Choshek because there's a higher level of wisdom. And while the Greek Empire was the um, great um, achievement of what man can achieve in this world, in the physical world, the heights that man can have in you know, athletics and, and, and theater and um, science and mathematics and all these great sciences, it's the pinnacle of man. But the Torah still calls it Choshek, calls it darkness. Because there's a greater wisdom that men can learn, that all of mankind can learn, which is which is the science of the spiritual world and how the higher spiritual worlds interact into this physical world. So, even though from uh, you know mankind's perspective, the Greek Empire was the beginning of this great um, you know culture of science and wisdom, it's in the realm of the physical world, and the Torah calls it darkness. So then the Tehom, then the the deep abyss represents the Roman Empire. And then when the Torah says the Ruach Elohim, that the, the spirit of Elohim, it hovers above the face of the water. And this is referring to Mashiach, and this is referring to the end of these four exiles, the end of these four empires, into a new age of mankind called Yemosa Mashiach, the uh, Messianic age. So there's other places in the Torah 
that refer to these four empires. And when we were in Mitzrayim, when we were in the very first exile in, in Mitzrayim in Egypt, which lasted 210 years, um, we say like during Passover, we say during Pesach, during the Seder, that there was four kinds of redemption that Hashem saved us from when we were in Egypt. And those four kinds of redemption each hint at the redemption from each one of these coming of the four empires. So let's, okay, let's dive right in. We'll learn a little more about these empires. Now we can discuss like how, how was it, how do we survive through all this? How, you know, how are we here today? How are we surviving through these tragedies of the three weeks? How do we survive through the last 4,000 years of history? And then how do we get out of it? How do we get out of this, uh, you know, the three weeks in the morning and the fast? And how do we turn it all back around to get to that, that final stage of the, uh, the Ruach Elohim, the spirit of Elohim hovering above the face of the water? How do we get to that, to that age, that, that era in uh, history? So we were, down, we, were, we were down in Egypt. So the Egyptian exile was 210 years. <clears throat> and then when we came out, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses led us out of Egypt, we, you know, we wandered, you know, famously through the Midbar, through the wilderness for 40 years. And then under Yeshua ben Nun, under Joshua, we, we entered the land of Israel, we conquered the land of Israel. And then we went through, I think it was about a period of, um, I think about 480 years. I'm sorry if I don't have these dates exact, but we went through a period called the Shoftim, period of the judges and that's before we had a king before we had a centralized leader and it was interesting because through that period of judges in the Torah it describes it very uh, specifically like you know if we listen to Hashem if we were following the Torah if we were doing the mitzvahs then we were blessed we had all this blessing raining down on us and we had peace and and our enemies weren't bothering us and and, and all the crops were very abundant and we had these periods of things being very good and then when as we started to drift away the book of Shoftim explains very specifically how, like, you know, we would have a, um, you know, a foreign leader that would come and oppress us. And then Hashem would rise up one of the Shofate, one of the judges to free us. So that period of Shoftim is kind of like a microcosm of all Jewish history. And it shows us the whole, you know, waxing and waning of all Jewish history. And, and it's simple a matter of like when we are coming closer, when we are pulling closer to Hashem, when we're learning Torah and following the mitzvahs, we, we reach these heights of history where things are very good for us. We have peace. You know, we, we're not being oppressed by the other, you know, nations and, and we're living in peace and we have abundant food and everything's good. And all of Jewish history goes through these periods. And the whole purpose of the exiles, of the Gullises, is that we are, we are expelled from Eretz Yisrael. And it's because we, we've, once again, we've drifted away from Hashem. We've drifted away from his Torah and his mitzvot. And we, we have to leave Eretz Israel. We have to leave, you know, our home. And then that, that, um, that feeling, like, I don't, you know, everyone's probably experienced, like, you know, you go someplace, you, you, you go, you know, you go out sometimes, and sometimes you just feel like such a stranger. You feel like you don't belong sometimes. And you just want to go back home, or you want to go back to some family, or go back to some friends, go back to where you belong. And I think everyone's experienced, you know, that, that sense of gullus, that sense of, like, I just don't belong here. I want to go back to where, where I do belong. And that's, and that's really the purpose of Gullus. And then what we want to achieve is the Gula, is the redemption from these Gulluses. So the first Gullus, the Tohu. So Daniel, Daniel, in Sefer Daniel, in the book of Daniel, he also had, he, um, he describes these four kingdoms. So Nebuchadnezzar, who was the first king of the Babylonian exile, who's going to be the first exile, he had a dream where he was shown a vision of all these four exiles. And unlike Pharaoh, unlike Paro in Egypt, the Paro, the Pharaoh, had a dream, but he didn't know its interpretation. So it was even, it was even more miraculous with Nebuchadnezzar. He not only had the vision, he had a dream of what was going to be with these four empires, but he, he couldn't even, not only did he not know the interpretation, he didn't even remember the dream. And then Hashem sent the dream and the interpretation to Daniel, to Daniel, to interpret. So in this vision, Nebuchadnezzar was given a vision of this great statue. And the statue had a head of gold. It was a statue of a large man and had a head of gold, which represented the Babylonian empire, Bava. And it had two arms of silver, which represented the two joint kingdoms of Persia and Media. And then it had a chest of uh, copper or bronze, and that represented the Greek empire. And then the legs 
were these two mighty legs of iron, and they represented the east and western portions of the Roman Empire. And then the very end of the statue, there was toes of iron and earth, and they were crumbling. And it's at the very end of the four kingdoms. And then he saw a stone hurling through the air, hurling through the sky, and the stone smashed into the statue, breaking it into a million pieces. And then that stone represents Mashiach. That stone represents the beginning of the Messianic age after these four empires. So at first, um, Yirmiyahu, in the period of kings, after the period of Shoftim, it was established that there was now kings in Israel. And the first king was Shaul. He was from the tribe of Binyamin. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And he became the first king. And then after him, David HaMelech started his dynasty, King David. And then famously, his son Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, who, birthed, who builds the first temple. So the first temple stands for 410 years, I believe. And then during that period, once again, as I say, we, like, we start drifting away. It, it, the whole, all of history is us coming closer to Hashem or drifting farther away to Hashem. And how we draw ourselves closer to Hashem is through learning the Torah, through doing the mitzvahs. It, it, it creates a kadusha, holiness in us, a tahar in us, a purity in us, and a spiritual purity. And we start to draw closer and closer to the infinite creator, to Hashem. And then the brachas, the blessings that he promised, rain down upon us. We have the blessings of peace and wealth, and, and things go well. But as we start to, but unfortunately that has, you know, there's a famous Pasuk, Yeshurun grew fat and he kicked. Yeshurun, there's three stages of development of the Jewish people. There, there's Yaakov, there's Yisrael, Israel, and then there's Yeshurun, which means Yeshar, like upright, straightforward, like, you know, an honest person. So when we reach that, even when we reach that highest level of Yeshurun, you know, we can, all the wealth and the peace, it, it can become, um, you know, it can become a detriment in some ways. And, it, and, it, and we start to drift away. Oh, we don't need Hashem. We don't need anything. And we start to drift away. We start to loosen our hold of the Torah and the mitzvot. And we start to loosen away. And that's when Hashem, unfortunately, has to wake us up. And, and Bava was our wake up. So Yirmiyahu, uh, Hanavi, Jeremiah the prophet, he was given Nebuah, and you can see it if you if you look into the book of uh, Yirmiyahu. You can see these prophecies, and we were given a prophecy that um, you know we'll be exiled. There will be a you know an army will come from the north and exile us, and that and that was Babel. So we were and we were told we'd be exiled for seventy years in Babel, and we were exiled, and then these seventy years was interesting. Because um, then people started, they weren't exactly sure when it started from. And there was a couple of miscalculations. And Daniel himself had his own dream, his own vision about these four kingdoms. But what's fascinating is while Nebuchadnezzar saw these four kingdoms as the pinnacle of mankind, because he saw these all as a statue, but Daniel saw these four kingdoms as beasts, as terrifying beasts. And only when he saw the vision of Mashiach, only when he saw the vision of a man coming down from the clouds, he saw that was where a human was supposed to be developing to. He says, well, you know, maybe these were steps along the way. Maybe these kingdoms were steps of all human history. But the completion of this would be in, in the age of Mashiach, Yemosa Mashiach, in the Messianic age, where mankind would reach its full growth, where it would truly have its humanity. So he saw these empires as these, these terrifying beasts. And he saw... Babel, Babylon, he saw it as a lion with eagle's wings. So it was strong and fierce, the king of all the wild animals, and had eagle's wings, and could fly quickly all through all the nations of the world and conquer them. So it's interesting. So Balshitzar, who I think was his, um, I think was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, he miscalculated these seven years, and he put on all the clothes of the, uh, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest in the temple, and he wore all the clothes, and he brought all of the gold and silver, you know, Kalim that they had conquered, you know, when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar had conquered and destroyed the base of Mikdash on Tishabov, and he brought these all back to, uh, to Babylon, and he wore, and, 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 and Balshazar threw this great feast, because he thought, like, the seven years had come and gone, and that's when Balshazar saw the handwriting on the wall, and uh, it was, it was, the, it was, and Daniel knew that this meant that this was the end of, of Babel and it was the beginning of the next empire, which was Paras and Madai, Persia and Media. So then uh, Cyrus, 
Koresh, he became the first king after um, after Daryavesh. Daryavesh was from Media. He was a Mede. He conquered Bashitsar. And and Cyrus or Koresh, he became king after um, after Daryavesh. And he um, he moved uh, the capital of the Persian Empire, moved it to Persia. And um, and he actually um, and, and Koresh was interesting. Cyrus that he he allowed the beginning of the second temple to begin. But then, as we go further into the Persian exile, once again, things begin to turn as, as we're, um, we're we're drawing we're drawing zeros away from Hashem, and then um, Achashverosh becomes king, and uh, I think Vashti, his wife, was uh, was the granddaughter of, Nebuch of Nebuchadnezzar, so he he married royalty from the Babylonian Empire, and once again Achashverosh, Achashverosh miscalculates. And he thinks the seven years are up, and he thinks the Jewish people won't be redeemed. And he throws also a great feast, and he puts on the clothes of the Kohen Gadol, and he brings all the gold and silver kaolin from the base of Mikdash, and he once again celebrates that, that the Jewish people are not going to be redeemed by Hashem. There will be no geula from this exile. And unfortunately, the Jewish people went to this feast, and it shows how we are drifting away from Hashem. Why would we celebrate that Hashem wasn't going to redeem us, that Hashem wasn't going to end this, this gullus? And that's when, you know, Haman, 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 you know, Haman rises up, the evil Amaliki. He rises up to become prime minister, and he wants to kill all the Jews. And how do we survive? How do we survive? We survive because of Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai, he, um, he realizes the danger, and, he, um, and even though Esther is the queen, Mordecai realizes that what's going to really save us is Teshuvah. Mordecai puts on sackcloth and ashes and tells the Jewish people and Esther also tells the Jewish people to start fasting and teshuva and teshuva the the root of the word teshuva means shuv return and it's all this cycle of we drift away from Hashem and then we come closer and now we, we we drifted away and there's this evil decree that you know we're to be killed and uh and Baruch Hashem and we did teshuva and, and Mordecai and Esther led us and you know we celebrate on Purim that Haman is, is killed and defeated. And, um, and then interestingly enough, the, the son of Achashverosh and Esther becomes Daryavesh II, Darius II. And he also, and then he renews the building of the second base of Mikdash, which is built by his son of King David, Zorobavel, who may have um, also been Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, it, um, the Gemara seems to think that it's the same person. And Nehemiah and... Um, and Zorobavel, the descendant of King David, are the same person. So this this Persian exile lasts for 52 years. Now the and then and then Daryavesh allows the Jewish people to start returning to the Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. So Ezra leads people back in Nehemiah, and they lead some Jews back. But it's interesting because most Jews stay in the Golis. So it's fascinating. It shows you how far we're starting to drift away. We're starting to get used to living away in Chutzlar. It's outside Eretz Yisrael. We're starting to get too comfortable in the in, in this exile in this Golas. So then the Greek Empire become, begins. And I think it was about 258 years. And as we said before, the Greek Empire began by Alexander the Great, started a new um, you know, new kind of culture of Hellenism. And it was interesting because he he um, he does great things in the world of like, you know, the you know, discoveries in science and, um, and art and culture. So it elevates the world to that. But, um, but it, can, um, it can also start to blind people to, to Hashem. I mean, you see now, like, where science is all gone. That science really is not, science, you know, is responsible, you know, for great advances in medicine and technology, which is good. But it can also lead people to start drifting away. Oh, they don't. They don't need God. They don't need Hashem. They don't need you know Hashem. We don't need this. But the true essence of the world is that there is this constant life force coming from this infinite being that's constantly creating the world anew every day, keeping every second. Hashem is keeping the world in reality, you know, in existence, and He's sending this life force to you know everyone that's living. And we really need this connection. The whole purpose of the creation is this connection. So this exile is, is a new kind of challenge where 
where we start to let astray because we start to focus so fully on the on the physical world that that, that we, we start to lose that desire for the, the rooking us, that spiritual connection and that connection that we need with Hashem. And the connection we need through learning his Torah and doing his mitzvahs. And the mitzvahs, even though science is great at um, maybe exploring the technologies and, and the uses of the physical world, but, it, but science doesn't necessarily make a person good. And the Torah is so valuable because the Torah is clearly defining what is good, what is evil, how do we become better people. And, and, it, and it forces us and it helps us elevate ourselves by mitzvahs like the Lerecha Kamocha, like love your friend like yourself, help you know the uh, help the poor through sedaka. You know, don't seek revenge, don't murder, don't steal. You know, just you know, mitzvah after mitzvah that, that's refining our characters and elevating us and connecting us. Not only is it connecting us to Hashem, it's connecting us to other people in more positive ways, and it's connecting us to ourselves. It's, it's making we are we are being, ourselves we are a relationship with ourselves we are becoming more refined more at peace so once again so the greek empire we start to have these challenges and this is constant challenge of drifting away from hashem and hashem sends like a conqueror and then the maccabees the hashmonayim in the miracle of hanukkah we fight the war against the greek empire and we rededicate the menorah in the base of mikdash Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. We built it, or I think I mentioned we rebuilt the base of Mikdash, the second temple. And I think it stood now for 420 years. So the Greek Empire, once again, it's this period of waxing and waning. And, and you even see that even the Hashmonayim themselves, even the kings, the Maccabean kings, they start to become so assimilated into Greek culture, they start to take on Greek names. And by the time it's over, I mean, they're almost, some of them are almost completely Greek and just separated from Torah and the mitzvahs. So then the Roman Empire begins, and, uh, and this is the final challenge. So Daniel saw this as a large beast. It's something unique. Everything else was defined as something that exists. Babylon, Bavo was described as a lion with eagle's wings. Paras and Madai, Persian media, were defined as a bear with three ribs in its mouth. The Greek Empire was described as a leopard with four wings and four heads, meaning it spread out quickly like a leopard in four, all four different directions of the globe and conquered, and four heads, meaning the four generals that split the empire after the death of Alexander the Great. But the Roman Empire was unique. It was considered a combination of all these three empires that had come before it. And this would be the longest Gaulus. This would be the longest exile. And this would be the most brutal. And this was the Roman Empire, and it was described as a unique beast, just this large beast, not anything recognizable even in creation, like no animal is mentioned specifically, just this large beast with iron teeth and ten horns that just tramples and crushes and destroys. And it's lasted till now. I mean, the Roman Empire, we're in the year 5779. The Roman Empire itself, I think, begins around uh, 3700. And then with the death of, uh, of King Herod, um, and I think it was 3760. So it's, a, it's actually the year zero as we're counting in the Western calendar. So we see that we're in 2019, 2019. So we're 2019 years of the Roman Gaulus. And, and it's exhausting us. And, and this Gaulus, it begins with the Roman Empire, you know, coming in, uh, Emperor Titus coming in the Yerushalayim on Tishabab and destroying <clears throat> the second base of Mikdash, the second temple. And this, and this is one that's been the most brutal. We have all the challenges from the, the first three, all the challenges of Bava, all the challenges of Paras and Madai, and all the challenges you know, of, of, of Greece. And it's all wrapped up in the one and more. And this is the one that's going to completely test us the most. And this is the one where we're constantly going through these waxing and waning, coming closer to Shem, drifting apart. In Chas Sham, we even saw so this evil Nazi leader, more wicked than Haman, from the same Amaleki, you know, heritage, you know, and Chasvacham. In that time, unfortunately, we didn't have this miraculous, we didn't have this miraculous, you know, like Purim miracle that time, and we were decimated. But but look what's happened. Look what's happened from the ashes, from the ashes of that great tragedy. We see in 1948, the same year that Abraham Avinu, the same year that Abraham was born. We see, you know, the reestablishment of the state of Israel. We see all these Jews coming from, from the Golas of Edom, returning to Eretz Israel, returning. 
So we see something positive now. We see that this waxing and waning, but we see there, there's the beginning a spirit of um, Jewish people waking up again, wanting to come back to our roots, come back to when we were close to Hashem, when we came out of Egypt, when we received the Torah, when we survived all these gulluses. We, we, we survived these 4,000 years because there is an infinite being that loves us, that we are connected to through our descent from Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, through these great men, through Abraham, and Sarah, and Sarah, and Yitzhak, and Rivka, from Isaac, and Rebekah, from Yaakov and Leah and Rachel, from, from Jacob and Rachel and Leah. And they, they created this close bond between us and Hashem. And, they, and Abraham made a bris, he made a covenant between us and Hashem. And we renewed that bond when we, we received this great gift. We received the Torah and Mount Sinai and Shavuos. And we see through all these exiles and this exile that we're still in, all the tragedies we survived, in the world of Esav, in, in, in the exile of Edom, we, we, the tragedies that we, you know, going through in Europe and, and Russia with the pogroms and the Crusades and the Holocaust and Inquisitions and, and in, 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 in the world of Yishmael in, in Arabia, I mean, all the, um, once again, the pogroms there. And in 1948, the, the Arab world was cleared out of, uh, of Jewish people. They were no, we were no longer allowed to live there. And, you know, Aaron, and now... We're not in these countries anymore. We used to live in Egypt and Jordan and Iraq, and there, there's still some Jews, interesting enough, in Persia. But uh, Saudi Arabia, no, and Syria, Lebanon, no. It's cleared out. Arabia is cleared out. Yishmael, the territory of Yishmael is cleared out of us. And only now this Gullus remains in Edom. And we're still in Gullus, even if we live in Eretz Israel. We're still, we're not there yet to that place of the, the Ruach Elohim, Spirit of Elohim hovering, the Yemotz of Mashiach. But we're, we're right there. We're right on the tip of it, the footsteps of Mashiach. But the, the thing that's given us strength to survive is through the Torah and the mitzvot. It's simple. I mean, it's like, it's so crazy that we could drift so far and think that the Torah and the mitzvot are not part of our core essence. But it's through our relationship with Hashem now we just we've survived these four thousand years. We've just, we've survived all these exiles, and and this is coming to a close. And we and when our when our hearts awaken, and we, we really want that connection back with Hashem, then this exile will end too. This two thousand nineteen years of this Gullus Edom, and then we will all return to Eretz Yisrael, and we will return to that close relationship we had with Hashem. We will rejoice. And we will rejoice in learning his Torah and doing his mitzvahs. So may we see the may Hashem send uh, the coming of Mashiach soon, and may we see that these three weeks of mourning and fasting and and, and travail turn into three weeks of celebration and, and you know celebrating on the seventeenth of Tammuz, the, the 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 receiving of the Ten Commandments, and celebrating on Tishabav, the land of Israel. May it may come sooner days. I right, hope you enjoy it. Hope to see you back again soon on Sweet and Good Torah.